Okay, thank you very much, uh, Tara. Uh, so many thanks to uh, Tara and many thanks to Sebastiano for inviting me. Uh, thanks to the ARA uh, Association and uh, welcome uh, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. It's my pleasure. So the, the title has been slightly changed. I propose uh, Standing Stones Cult, the case of MR in the Late Bronze Age. Uh, just an, as, as an introduction, let me say that um, Sorry, now I can move to the next. Uh, MR and its uh, cult involving the standing stones uh, as it is attested in the cuneiform text is a quite old story uh, for me. It has been my PhD research field until the publication of the volume of OBO 266, but that was already in 2014. But since I never really left the cults of MR, so to say, and it is my real pleasure today to come back uh, to the question of a standing stones cult as attested in the different rituals of MR and especially since the publication of the monograph of John Tracy Thames, uh, The Politics of Ritual Change, the Zucru Festival in the Political History of Late Bronze Age MR, which is a, a, Semitic, a Harvard Semitic monograph just published in 2020. As a matter of fact, themes come back on several topics raised in my previous book and sometimes even shared some of my perspective. So it's a great occasion to discuss uh, some of these elements today uh, with you. So briefly, just to see how I uh, intend to organize uh, the talk after a very brief historical context, just to put some light on the, the situation of Ashtata and the Hittite Empire. I will give some information on the site of MR that should be quite brief. And then we will focus on the MR text, uh, mention the problem and the questions uh, raised about the practice of religion and rituals in MR under Hittite rule uh, before going to deeper in the text, mentioning the worshiping of stones, especially the Zucrum. Um, and we will see some of the elements mentioned in the text, like, like the processions and the veiling of the statues, uh, the anointing of stones and some uh, ritual concerning the burnt offerings before concluding of um, uh, this question, how could or how should we understand the meeting of a statue with a standing stone in an open air uh, sanctuary as it is attested in the MR text. So for a brief historical context, MR was a very important uh, city as a traffic junction, occupying a liminal position between the upper Mesopotamia, uh, so in the Assyro-Babylonia region and the Syro-Anatolian cultural sphere. From the 14th century, Hittite power controlled Ashtata in which MR was one of the most important cities so I refer here to uh, Cohen, the Administration of Cult in Hittite MR, published in 2009, uh, who defines MR as a, the capital of the Ashtata region, even if sometimes it's possible that the geographical uh, words MR and the land of Ashtata are commutable. Indeed, sometimes MR and Ashtata has been considered as being one and the same entity. And um, so if we consider MR as one of the most important cities in the Ashtata, it was then on the account of the kings uh, in Carchemish. <laughs> it is worth noting that the king, uh, the Hittite king Murshidi II had carried out a vast campaign of reconquest of the south of the empire to counter the revolt of the Syrian subjects. So here you have a map of the expansion of the Hittite Empire just before the Battle of Kadesh, the Kadesh Battle. So here we can say we are about 1300 BC uh, because you, you see that uh, the Hittites are going far more to the, to the south. Uh, whereas after the, the Battle of Kadesh, of course, uh, the southern limit will be cl very uh, close, I mean, closest to uh, Kadesh. As winters were uh, long and hard in Anatolia, there was no possibility to campaign uh, abroad. As a result, the Hittite Empire preferred to annex and to associate vassal states rather than integrate them on economic and political levels. 
The Hittites therefore left the administration of the state to the local elites or to princes from the Hittite court. Vassas had to pay tribute to the empire. They had to supply soldiers and to forego relations with foreign empires or kingdoms. Hittite garnison were placed in the vassal kingdoms. This is the case in Emor as well, in order to ensure better the control, which was also the case, as I said, in Emor. Indeed, the Hittite Visroi in Syria was usually involved in the administration of Emor. The so-called Bel Madgalti, or the district governor in Hittite Anatolia, was an officer involved first in military affairs but also in the general administration of the province. Therefore, he was also present during the registration of legal document and is seated among witnesses in several legal documents. As it is attested in the text MR 460, the Bel Madgalti also took part in the local religious life. In this text, he participates in the cult of Ishtar Tahasi, Inanna Me and consumes beer together with the diviner of MR, together with the lady of the palace and the blacksmith of the city, as it is stated in the text. Arguably, the most important discovery on the site was that uh, of a religious area, which included several temples exhibiting zero Hittite architectural features. Especially a double sanctuary was dedicated uh, to Baal and perhaps to his Syrian consort. So here you have a general view on the site of Emar with the late Byzantine uh, site and here the Bronze Age uh, city. And you have here a close up on this um, area, the Zogenante Temple Bezirk uh, with the double temple. So the one dedicated to Dagan and maybe the other one to the uh, Syrian consort, maybe Chebat. The building. If we move now to uh, the center of the city, I'll just let me come back here. So this is the area with the temple. And in the lower city, we have the building where the archive was found, the so-called house of the diviner. Here you have a close up. The building called M1 was also found uh, at the same time, but in the lower city. This is where we stand now. This building is important because of the numerous texts that were found in its archive, especially a letter dating back to the reign of the Babylonian king uh, Melishihu uh, allows us, according already to Daniel Arnaud, to assign the destruction of the city to the year 1187 BCE. Since this document it, it is the latest known, it bends the event of the late Bronze Age uh, namely the destruction of some of the empires around the Mediterranean uh, to an absolute chronology. Uh, so the city could not have been destroyed before this date, obviously. Documents for MR provide a very valuable source of information concerning the organization of the Hittite administration in Syria. In particular, they help us to understand the interaction between two different cultures, the Syrian and the Anatolian ones, in MR, which lay on the border of two different uh, cultures or words. The international nature of this area can be seen in the variety of languages attested in MR documents, Babylonian and Assyrian, Akkadian, Hittite, or Hurrian. Governed by a local vassal dynasty under the narrow control of Hittite officers, MR existed for approximately 130 years as a provincial city whose only goal was to close the passage from the west to the east to the Assyrians. And so the city disappeared shortly after the end of the Hittite empire. The site of MR Tel Meskene lies in the middle Euphrates Valley, which is today partially covered by the Lak Assad, Buhayrat al-Assad, as you see here on the picture. The first cuneiform tablet was discovered on the site in 1971. After that, the Syrian government planned the construction of the Tabqa Dam. This discovery prompted the need of an important archaeological exploration. French excavations took place between 1970 and 1976. Because of the lack of vestige of the older city, 
Jean-Marc Guerrand, the archaeologist of the time, assumed that the Hittite king undertook the construction of a new city outside the easily fluted zone. This would likely have been due to the development of the a meander of the Euphrates by 1320 BC. In this interpretation, the site would have undergone two distinct phases, the city of the Middle Bronze Age on the one hand and the city of the Late Bronze Age on the other. However, German excavations allow us today to discuss this theory further. From 1996 to 204, the site was excavated anew by the German University of Tübingen in collaboration with Princeton University and the Syrian Antiquities Department. This project, the most recent of the excavations of MR, has allowed us to better understand the history of the site. In particular, it is clear that the ancient city of MR has always been situated at the same place. Whereas the French excavations only found the late Bronze Age remains, the University of Tübingen excavated 18th century city walls. They therefore concluded that MR was not a new town established only during the period of the late Bronze Age, uh, the, uh, during the period of the late Bronze Age, sorry. MR was then part of the Hittite Empire. Indeed, by the end of the 14th century, Ashtata and MR had already entered the Hittite sphere of influence. Let me uh, continue now uh, with some remark on the MR text. More than 1,170 cuneiform tablets were found on the site and offer a prosopography of more than three and a half generation. About 800 texts comes from uh, the French excavation while the rest turn up at the art market. The majority of the texts are written in Akkadian, but about 100 texts are in Hurrian and a few are in Hittite. Most of the excavated religious document for local cults was discovered in the M1 uh, building, so-called the house or the temple of the diviner, together with lexical text in the Mesopotamian tradition and legal records dealing with real estate, marriages, and adoptions. This house was the archive and the library and also a school uh, led by a family of diviners, the so-called Zubala family. The text can be divided into three main categories, ephem ephemeral documents, cultic documents, and scholarly texts. And inside the religious text, this is what you have here, uh, the three uh, major ritual, which is the installation of the N2, the installation of the Mashartu, the Kisu festival and the Zukrum festival represent 12% of the whole text. And the legal text is more than the half of the whole uh, collection. It is important to underline the fact that the religious text that we deal with in this uh, lecture was discovered in this very house of the diviner. Thanks to the Mari archives, one can appreciate the commercial power of the city at the time of Hammurabi of Babylon already. For the latter Mitanni period, it is the Ugarit archive that gives particular insight. Let's note as well that following an article by Fleming and uh, Lafont, uh, Daniel Fleming and Sophie Demar Lafont, Tablet Terminology at MR Conventional and Free Format. We has been, um, this distinction has also been done by uh, Thames. We can consider two different formats in the MR text, conventional and so-called free format, which was considered zero Hittite. And normally, uh, even if there is an overlap, conventional text should be considered older than the free format text found in the M1 uh, archive, even if, as I said, there is a short overlap of the two different system. By zero Hittite free format, Fleming and Lafont consider this is a non-style with a variety uh, of uh, innovations. And it's a non-conformist innovative scribble current that came into its own in the late phase of the MR existence before its destruction um, at uh, 1180. So if we continue now about the religion, and the uh, rituals and their Hittite rule in MR. 
So while matters of Hittite administration in the city have been already discussed, uh, see for example, the article by Yamada or Cohen, uh, the religious question has been less studied. We can mention of course, uh, Doris uh, Prechel uh, that posed the question of Anatolian rituals at MR and the question has been also studied uh, by myself and also uh, with the latest monograph of Thames that I uh, mentioned. The occurrence of Anatolian cults practice uh, uh, in the 13th century MR seems to indicate that Hittite deities and Hittite cults were present in MR. If we think of MR 471, we read, so Tupu Parsisha Dingir Kur Hatti, uh, Uru Anta Ukita Anuma, which is so the tablet of ritual for the gods of Hati, upper towns and lower towns, it is so and blah, blah, blah. So this text indicates uh, to me that Hittite deities were indeed worshipped in MR and thus that there was no special area in town uh, that could be considered as reserved specifically for the Hittite people or for the members of the Hittite army. Um, uh, furthermore, the texts are being written in Akkadian, which indicates that they concern the priests uh, of the town. And I also would like to mention a letter, MR 271, that was found in the so-called House of the Diviner as well, that reads as uh, follow. And let me go back just to the translation now. In the morning, send your son to feed the Hittite deities. Don't make him late. The beer should not go stale. Concerning the carpenter about whom you wrote, I send him to you. So as we can see here with this uh, Akkadian letter, so written uh, in Akkadian, we see that local uh, people were feeding Hittite uh, deities, right? So Hittite deities were fed in MR and could be considered as part of the local pantheon. The young boy here mentioned in the letter is a local inhabitant, show us how to worship in a way divinities of Hatti in MR. And that suggests that Anatolian rituals were also transferred from Hittite uh, into Akkadian, were uh, translated, sorry, from Hittite into Akkadian for local purposes. Uh, but obviously uh, there are different interpretation about this matter for Arki, however, under Murshili II, at least I quote, not only was there no superimposition of foreign cults on the local cults, but Murshili considered introducing the rites of Ashtata of the goddess Ishkara to Hatusha, which is uh, exactly the opposite uh, as a way to interpret uh, it, which is another possibility. And further, he mentions, I quote, it is therefore remarkable that Hittite dominion at MR, despite adapting to Hurrian tradition, nonetheless did not end up superimposing Hurrian cults over the local ones, where Hurrian elements are only infrequent. So this is the end of quotes. And on the other hand, uh, now in the new publication of Thames, uh, he states that the Zubala diviners worked for the Hittites and not only uh, on the local administration level, uh, but the Hittite authorities were deeply interested and actively involved in supporting and managing the emirate rights, even if for him there is no reason to assume that the mere existence of cults of Anatolian gods indicates that they were forcibly imposed at MR, end of quote. Our point of view is that Huro Hittite practices were indeed introduced in MR as part of the general program of cult reorganization undertaken by Puduhepa and Tutkhaliya IV, and that some Hittite gods became integrated in the local cults like for example, the Dahanga and the Dahagunanu from Nerik that are attested at the same time in MR. And Thames uh, noted, uh, and let me quote again, yet a subtler dimension of this delicately negotiated cultic importation 
is the way it facilitates MR's identification of belonging within the empire. Moreover, recalling that the deities of the blended foreign cult are not exclusively Hittite, but rather stem for all over the empire, participation in this cult promotes a cosmopolitan mindset that situates MR as one among many parts of the whole, end of quote. And there is a dimension of this import, uh, importation of religious culture that represent imperial interference in provincial religion. Obviously, the main topic here today is not to deal with Hittite cult in MR, but it's still an interesting and important element. The main topic for me now is to try and understand the rites that were practiced in order to worship standing stones in MR during the late Bronze Age. How should stones be worshipped in MR during the late Bronze Age? Some rites are known and give some insight in the actual practice of rites. Let's have a better look at different texts. As I said, we will deal with the installation ceremony of the N2 priestess, with the installation ceremony of the Mashar II priestess, and uh, mostly, I should say, I will deal with uh, the MR Zukru text 373. Dating to the end of the Late Bronze Age, three main rituals that I have mentioned have come down to us, two of which shed light both on the ritual practices, such as anointing of statues and stones and burnt offerings associated with the installation of priestesses and the Zukrum, which concerns the religious life of the whole city. So the Ezen, so the ritual of the Zukrum. In fact, there are two different versions of the Zukrum ritual in MR. We deal here with MR 375 that might be older than MR 373. So it dates back to the period when MR was free of foreign involvement represented by the diviner and their Hittite officials. So this is uh, the first uh, version. Whereas MR 373 is an expansion uh, to quote Thames of MR 375, an expansion of the ritual under Hittite ages of Karkemish. This expansion could be dated to the time of Heshmi Teshub, who was a Dumulugal and the brother of Initeshub, the king of Karkemish. And that's the reason why you have on the right of the screen the seal of Initeshub, the king of Karkemish, because the text in MR has been. Uh, rewritten under the time of his brother, Heshmi uh, Teshu, being a Dumulugal. So during the great uh, Zukrum, which is MR 373, written in the free format, so this ritual happened every seven years, the most specific element is the fact that the anthropomorphic statue of the god, uh, Dagan, is brought out of his temple and out of the city to reach an open air sanctuary in the countryside. And here, of course, we have parallels that exist in Hittite rituals. This open air sanctuary is composed of different elements necessary for the ritual. The first of which are a group of standing stones representing gods. These stones also gave the name to the sacred place called in the text, the gate of the Sikanu the gate of the standing stones. It is worth noting that the Zukrum text, I mean here the tablet of the text, is divided by a double line inscribed on the tablet in two parts, with a third, uh, third part at the end, which recall uh, the way um, of uh, writing Hittite rituals, which contain the same schedule, but with underli which underlines different elements and here you see in the publication by Daniel Fleming for the second part of the text on the screen, you clearly see the reproduction of the double line uh, mentioning, um, so the second part of the text that repeats some of uh, the elements that are already uh, given in the first part of uh, the text. 
So if we read uh, uh, the translation of uh, the text, so the line 167, uh, this is the beginning that is repeated here. When the sons of the land of Emar give the Zucru festival to Dagan, Lord of the offsprings during the seventh year, during the sixth year in the months of Sagmu, on the 15th day, the Shagar day, they bring out Dagan, Lord of offspring in procession, his face is uncovered. They perform the lesser sacrifice homage before him at the gate of the upright stones. After the sacrifice, eat and drink, they cover his face. The wagon of Dagan passes between the upright stones. He proceeds to Ninurta and they have Ninurta mount the wagon with him. Their faces are covered. On the same day, they purify all of the oxen and sheep. On the same day, they bring out all of the gods just before the evening. They bring out Shagar from Ninurta's temple and the house of assistance. Also the bread and the meat that were before all of the gods go up into Emar. So here is just one um, interesting description. Um, and the, the most distinctive element uh, of the stone ritual here in Emar is the fact that the anthropomorphic statue of the god is brought out of this temple uh, and out of the city to reach this opener sanctuary, uh, the name of which is given as the gate of the standing stones. And uh, we should be here outside of the city, maybe in the countryside, where I believe the original essence of the divine was considered to be. This festival gives a very complete vision of the several rites carried out during uh, the ceremony. So we have the sacrifices, we have the mention that people can eat and drink, and the offering that are given to um, the divinities and also the mention of the use of the Margidda, which is the, the chariot using for going between uh, the standing stones for Dagan and uh, Ninurta uh, together. In the beginning of the text mentioned, so when the sons of Emar give the Zukrum, so indicating here that um, this festival was for all uh, the city. Um, I should apologize for the picture. It was very difficult to find some images to show instead of only having text. So that's the reason why here you have a Dura Europos uh, picture showing the temple of Dagan, which is obviously out of context here, but it was just a way to uh, have some illustration. So if we deal now with the, the, the procession and the veiling of the, the statue, so we have several different mentions here in the, in the text or from the first part of the text, but also from the second part of the text. So if we read line 25, we have the mention that the deity Shashabitu of Ninurta's temples goes out at the gate of the Stikanu. Uh, further in the text, uh, they mentioned that they make Beletekali go out, the moon god and the sun god of the palace go out at the gate of the Sikanu. Uh, number 4547, Dagan, lord of offsprings, Ninurta, Shashabetu of Ninurta's temple, Ninegal, the moon god and the sun god of the palace, all the gods and the Shashabeyanatu spirits they make go out at the gate of the Sikanu. So this is what we saw before, but in a more uh, detailed version. So the mention of all the divinities that are uh, brought out of the temple in procession in order to reach uh, this gate of the Sikanu. And 163, the mention of the chariot of Dagan that passes between the standing stones. And the parallel in the second part of the text that repeat uh, line 180, three, no, here, sorry, uh, that the chariot of Dagan passes between the standing stones and at nightfall, Dagan passes uh, between the standing stones as well. So the procession, which leads from the inner city to the opener sanctuary, passes through a gate. This gate serves as the limen through which the deity travels from one space to another. 
The very name of the gate, gate of the Sikanu or gate of the standing stones indicates its cultic importance. Although we do not know where exactly the gate was, it was never discovered by the archeologist, its name indicates clearly that it was directly linked to the place of worship. The text tells us that the deities go out to this gate where the stones stand. The second part of the Zucru tablet mentions a procession for the going, but also a procession for the returning of Dagan. The first procession occurs by day, but the second one at nightfall. So the first procession takes place between the temple in the city center and the, and the open air sanctuary outside. And the returning procession takes place on the journey uh, from uh, the outside uh, open air sanctuary to the temple, but at night. So Dagan passing between the stones, maybe in the Kirkum Ambulatio, was a very important moment of the celebration during the Zucrum. And the meeting of the statue of Dagan in Indurta with the standing stone was the main purpose of this festival, so that the god could meet a divine assembly. That is the reason why the text maybe insists on Dagan's aspect. You may remember when I was reading the text that after passing between the stones, Dagan goes to the statue of Ninurta, uh, who was the tutelary deity of the city, who gets into the chariot and joins uh, Dagan. And this is the last step of the lithic ritual before the celebrants turn back to the city. On the other hand, this second part of the text clearly insist on the visibility of the statue of Dagan for a slightly different interpretation of the use of the veil uh, on the Dagan statue. See um, the publication of Thames, uh, page 212. So if we look here at the summary, uh, what happened during the ritual, uh, so on the 15th of Sagmu, we see that the statue of Dagan is veiled when he goes out in procession. And the statue of Dagan is veiled after the sacrifice. The statue of Dagan and Inurta are veiled during the procession. On the, 25, on the 25th of Nikali, during the sixth year, all the gods are brought out to the standing stones and the statue of Dagan is veiled when he goes out in procession and the statue of Dagan is also veiled for going out and returning. And this is also what we see uh, here during the seven days of the seven year, the statue of Dagan is veiled to go to the standing stones and the statue of Dagan is unveiled after the fire in order to pass between the stones. So uh, the deity is unveiled only in front of the standing stones which underlines the importance of this ritual moment. Normally, the statue of Dagan appears unveiled only in front of the stones. There might also have been a wish to control people access to Dagan's statue through the vehicles of his um, uh, vision, uh, which is treated as a very important element. Veiling also appeared during the installation of the N2 of Baal, because at the moment she has to leave the father's house, the priestess of Baal is veiled. And this occurs on the last day of the ritual. At the moment of leaving, her face is covered with a red fabric that belongs to the temple of Ninkur. And on the first day of the ritual, Ninkur herself was covered with a veil when she appeared in the priestess father's home. It is likely that this was the same veil that was used by the priestess at the moment of her final procession to the temple of Baal. During the Mashartu installation, we don't deal with a veil, but we act by night. Acting by night or using a veil, the visibility of the cult functionaries and the deities was always under control and the access to the divine sphere rarely open to everyone. From this point of view, one could conclude that the visibility was an issue during the performance of rituals and that the ritual text had to give very clear information about it. Furthermore, the fact that the Zucrum text repeats the program twice 
insisting differently on some aspects could indicate that the practical aspect of the text was real. The visibility of the divine statue of Dagan was clearly the purpose of the second part of the text. Let's uh, move to another uh, ritual practice, which, which is uh, the unction or anointing of stones. During the ritual of the installation of Baal N2, the Chebat standing stone is anointed with oil by the, by the priestess, and then the priestess herself is anointed in a similar fashion by the great diviner of the city. We are here on the so-called Kadushu day, and the text mentions that the diviner is paid for his job. As the new priestess is chosen by casting lots, one can understand that the diviner is paid for his job and he wanted this information to be clearly written in the ritual text. After that, the ritual text mentioned the galubu, which is the shaving of the priestess head. And it's after the priestess head's uh, shaving that the priest will anoint uh, with oil her head. Obviously, it was uh, much more easier uh, without hair on her head. Uh, and we see, it, uh, we see it here in MR 369. Fine oil from the palace and from the temple of Ninkur they take and on her head they put. One shekel of silver is given to the diviner. So the unction, the unction established here a very strong link between the heavenly spouse of the god, which is here the standing stones of Chebat, and the earthly cognate. In the Zukrum festival, anointing the stones take place after the deities feast with the blood of the sacrificed animals, and Dagan passes between the stones before the offering ritual. But the unction described is made of a mix of blood and oil. So you see here, kime kuna sikanati ishtu i mesh u mesh ipashu. So after eating and drinking, the stones are anointed with oil and blood. The anointing of stones with blood might, might be interpreted as a way to make the stones participate in the feasting with the blood of the sacrificed animals. We have to notice that despite the name of the sacred opener sanctuary, the standing stones are worshipped only after the feasting. It's only after eating and drinking, mentioned in the text, that the, that the stones can be anointed. After the anointment, the procession goes back to town. As it took place at the end of the whole ritual, the ancient cannot then be considered as a consecration rite, but uh, we understand that the standing stone of the god is uh, rubbed or anointed with the blood from the sacrifice that the, the, the people will uh, eat the uh, animal afterwards. The last rites I would like to deal with is the use of burnt offerings. This particular offering ritual appears at several different moments of the Zukrum celebration, and it is here deeply linked to the burnt offering called Ambashu. Uh, the sacrifice uh, of burnt offering is not specific to the Zukrum because we find uh, it in other uh, festival um, of MR, but the use of the verb ikalu, mentioning that the whole uh, animal is burnt, is very specific to the Zukrum because we find it nowhere in Syria or Mesopotamia. But examples of burnt animal offerings are attested in Hittite Anatolia, in the Greek uh, world, and in the Bible in Exodus 29, for example. So here we have when the celebrants get back to town a goat is burned for Dagan and Minurta at the central gates. They burn this goat for all the gods with the Kalu verb, uh, meaning maybe that um, we have to completely burn uh, the animal. The use of this specific verb is important and significant and could indicate as well that it was necessary to practice the ritual 
with written prescription in order to not completely uh, forgot uh, what to do for the gods. And we can also note that uh, burnt offering is attested, at the, attested sorry, during the same time in Hittite New Kingdom period, outside Syria and outside Kizuatna, we have that kind of mention in the Antarshum festival, for, for example, where a combination of Ambashu and Keldi appears on the 25th day when worshiping the Hurian goddess Shaushka of Katarina and at Zipalanda and Ambashi, Arhanza, uh, Kashgeshkin, Chipanti. So they make, they offer a libation in Ambashi form with wine, beer. So here you have uh, an Ambashu with a liquid. So it's like uh, a libation uh, and um, uh, the burning of uh, liquids. And this is also very interesting because um, the, this kind of uh, sacrifice and offerings is attested in MR in the so-called Anatolian rituals, when we have in MR 471, the fact that a vase khurtiyalu of wine and a vase khurtiyalu of barley beer, they burn for the embashu or for the embashi. So here you have a, a very strong parallel between uh, the practice in Hittite Anatolia and in uh, MR. So in the Zukrum, we don't have the mention of embashu, but we have the mention of burnt offering with a verb that might be understood as the need of burning the whole uh, animal. So as said, we find burnt animal offerings nowhere else in Syria. So how did it become involved in the Zukrum uh, of MR? It should be understood in terms of Hurrian substract in this area but also in relation to Hittite administration of the cults. Gates and doors that are um, uh, uh, used during the ritual, uh, which is the main central gate or the gate of the Sikanu, uh, serve as places for offerings and ritual practices because going out of the temple with the statue of the deities and then going out of the city is a dangerous issue. The god being out of its house is more vulnerable. That's maybe the reason why one should veil the god and ask protection for the going and the coming back of the statue in its temple. One should also prevent the enemy for stealing the statue. Furthermore, MR's gate of rituals are to be considered as borders between the urban and the non-urban or wild world. However, the statue of the deity has to return intermittently from the urbanized world to the nature when the aniconic, the standing stone, and the original form of the deity is. And this crossing of the limen, this crossing of the border, could not happen without very specific offerings to the gods. So let me now uh, conclude. How can we understand the meeting of a statue with a standing stone in an opener sanctuary? Worshipping deities means taking care of the gods and feeding them. Several rituals are attested in MR in the religious text. So we saw briefly the processions, the veiling, the use of oil and blood for anointing and different kind of offerings. All the cases presented here concern mainly the rites executed with processions removing the statue of the deity out of the temple into an open air sanctuary. During the ritual, the anthropomorphic statue meets his aniconic double. Such a meeting appears to be periodical and linked either to an annual cycle or to a seasonal cycle. In both cases, the procession leading the statue to the sanctuary where the stone stood was an important event. Several rites were necessary during the procession. Some included passing through gates and maybe avoiding visual contact with the deity through its veiling. 
The different ritual texts presented here help us to understand the way stones and divine statues were worshipped together. Offering were made in different form, oil, bread, meat, beer, with anointing and burning of animal, goat and sheep. The ancient can be of different kinds. The use of blood is rare in Mesopotamia, but well documented in the Hurrian context of Syria and Anatolia during late Bronze Age. In the text, the blood is clearly identified with the blood of the slaughtered animal and used to feed the aniconic deity. The emirate Zucrum should primarily be the moment when Dagan meets his own stone in front of all the deities of the city. It is the meeting of the aniconic form of Dagan and his anthropomorphic statues. As in his case, all the deities of Emor came out of the city and went to the gate of the standing stone in order to meet their own stones. We have at least the mention of the stone of Chebat and the stone of Ninurta. The other one are not uh, namely uh, identifiable. This meeting corresponds as I propose to interpret it the, to the necessity of the handmade statue of the deity to go to the original place of its cult. A handmade statue was not considered to be a divine image directly after its fabrication. It is known, for example, that the Mesopotamian ritual mispi, so the washing of the mouse, permits the human-made statue to become a divine image. The most important element in this ritual is that the hands of the craftsman are symbolically cut with a wooden sword. This ritual act is necessary to make the statue enter the divine sphere after its fabrication. Such a ritual shows how the ancient civilization of ancient Near East were conscious of the non-divine state of the new divine statue made with hands human hands. On the other hand, the, religious, uh, the religions were naturalistic. Sun, stars, rivers, mountains were divine. Stones found in nature or on a mountain near rivers or under trees could have been sacred. Amorphous stones could have been considered as sacred because they were given as such by gods in the nature. Taking this element into consideration, the aniconic standing stone was seen as the best way to materialize divine power. Each handmade divine statue had at least one standing stone outside of the city and needed to be regularly led back to the standing stone in order to be like recharged with divine essence. The same kind of procession existed at the same time in Anatolia where the storm god of whatever town went out in spring and in autumn to meet his standing stone in open air sanctuary. The naturalistic character is strongly expressed in Hittite rituals where stones are placed under trees or next to rivers and sometimes on mountain. The regularity of the ritual is expressed at least in the cult inventories with the baking of breads. At every celebration, bread was baked with fl flour made of mashed grain from the last harvest. The breaking of the bread was the most important offering rite. The relation between aniconic stones and the anthropomorphic statues in Hittite rituals is very strong. Stones stand everywhere in the countryside and all the rituals, cult inventories as well as the Kilam and the Antarshum or the ritual of the goddess of the night, to give some example, deal with standing stones in Anatolia. The natural landscape of Anatolia was full of cliffs and rocks. The strength of the storm god was easily materialized in the solidity of the stone. Furthermore, the standing stone of the slope of a mountain seen as the residence of the storm god's hypostasis was considered as a replica of the very mountain. At the end, in this context, the divine statue could only be worshipped in its relation to an aniconic stone of the same god. I shall here come back to one element regarding the Zucrum. As mentioned, we have two different versions of it, MR 373 and MR 375. 
Fleming and Thames consider that MR373, the short uh, 75, sorry, the short Zucrum is older than the long version. As for Thames, to posit influence of Hittite religion concept of the Sicanus tombs on the Zucrum ritual would certainly be mistaken despite the correspondences. MR375 is an early form of the Zucru ritual predating the direct involvement of the Hittite empire in MR. The use of the stone in this ritual showed that their presence in MR was not dependent upon Hittite influence. This last remark is due to the fact that in my book, Oboe 276, I considered both texts MR375 and MR373 um, from different scribal tradition, but possibly dating to the same period because there is an overlap of some time for both tradition. But even if we consider one text older than the other one, I would argue like Thames that the very way in which activities surrounding the stones were incorporated into the expanded version of the Zucrum version was influenced by Hittite ritual forms indeed. It is clear that standing stones cult existed in Syria long before Hittite control over the area. We can think of occurrences of standing stones in the Mari uh, cults and in the fact that standing stones are attested in the Ebla text, for example. But what we see in the Zucrum, as far as I see it, is a colorized or a Hittitized version of the ritual. And to quote uh, at the end, Thames, it is clear that the Hittites greatly expanded the pre-existing Zucrum ritual, endowing it with previously inconceivable levels of funding and reinterpreting some of its elements in line with Hittite practices. We should then include, as, as stated years ago, and as I conclude now, now MR in the Hittite cultic program, the Zucrum being put into the Hittite mode of festival practice. And we should, we should consider the MR, the MR version of the Zucrum festival 373 in free format as a proof of this process. Here is uh, a selected bibliography uh, from the articles and monographs I mentioned. And I do thank you very much for your attention.